Please welcome President and Chief Executive Officer of the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, Lejeune Montgomery Tabron. So good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to be here with you this morning, and we're going to have a great conversation today, a very important conversation. But before I get started, how many of you were in this room and heard Van Jones speak? I just thought he was awesome, one of those awesome people that he spoke of. And uh, many times people come up and say, boy, I hate to have followed Van Jones. I am so happy I am following Van Jones <laughs> because his message will resonate throughout this particular conversation. He spoke a lot about bringing people together. He spoke a lot about action and how you make change and you, get, you make change happen through people. And this panel will talk about how change is happening and we're going to share with you some awesome people who are doing, making change happen throughout the state of Michigan. So I hope you enjoyed the video. I didn't need to remind any of you of this pandemic that we have been continuing to navigate for several years. And what we wanted to share with you is that there are many pandemics going on uh, in our nation. Start this session particularly as I start this session as the president and CEO of the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, whose North Star is about children and knowing that children are at the heart of everything we do. I just want to acknowledge our children who lost their lives in Uvalde and acknowledge the action that we must take to protect our children and bring safety to our children as they navigate normal lives in this nation. And I hope by the end of this session and the end of this time up here on Mackinac that together we can determine what's needed for children to thrive. And that's action on the ground and that's policy as well. And I'm hoping, as Van spoke about, that we can come together and build the type of policies that protect our young children as they go through their daily lives. And as I said to my team, children can't vote, unfortunately, because I know what they would vote for. But what we have to do is put the in our, to children in our hands and do what's right to protect them. So I thank you all for that. And <clears throat> so again, as I said at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, children are at the heart of everything we do. And our work in Michigan has been strong on this front. Uh, for the past 30 years, we've invested over $1.6 billion in this state for children, families, and communities. We believe that for children to thrive, their families have to be able to support them and take care of them, which means their family members need access to employment opportunities. And our children need access to health care, to education. And more importantly, we all need racial equality so that the opportunities are equal because we've seen through this pandemic what inequality can do for an, a state, for a nation. We must begin to narrow the gaps of inequalities in our state. And what we know is when we do that, it improves the lives for all of us. And that is our work behind the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. And we know that that work is work on the ground, but it's also work about systems and transforming systems so that they are more equitable. And our conversation this morning will be about great leaders across the state who are doing just that, who are leading in the action of removing barriers 
for people and families. We spoke about essential workers during the pandemic. And the definition of an essential worker became very clear to us. And we saw how much we needed them and how they are essential to our lives. And yet, when you look at those essential workers, many of them were people of color with less benefits and less access to greater opportunities. But now we understand that, and I think our work ahead must be to protect all workers and to allow every person to access their own pathway toward employment and vitality. And at the Kellogg Foundation, we look at that in three ways. One, we look at workforce development. We also look at removing barriers for people who are pursuing opportunities and need wraparound support in this regard. And we also look at entrepreneurship and how you build pathways of wealth and prosperity for people as they pursue their dreams. And what you're here today from these wonderful women, and it happens to be a, a power women panel today, but what you'll hear from them is how they have taken this on in their communities. And what we believe is at the end of the day is leadership that makes all of this happen. It's us, it's people. Systems do not materialize in, a, in and of themselves. They're created by people. And they're also transformed by people. And you'll see the type of transformation that's happening throughout the state. So with no further ado, I am honored to present our panelists. And first, I'd like to present, and please come up as I say your name, Cheryl Bergman. Cheryl is the CEO of Michigan Women's Commission. Cheryl was appointed by Governor Whitmer to this role in 2019 and works every day to talk to women in our state about their need to thrive. She and the Women's Commission have instituted an innovative program to support affordable, quality childcare for Michigan's families called TriShare. I'm so excited for you to hear about the work that Cheryl is doing. Cheryl Bergman. Second, I'd like to present Shauna Lewis. Shauna is the Vice President of Talent Acquisition and Workforce Programs at Trinity Health, one of the largest Catholic health systems in the United States. And Shauna has worked at the forefront of two exciting workforce support programs in Grand Rapids, one called Higher Reach and the second called Rise Up. They both have created outstanding results for workers and employers, and I'm looking forward for you to hear more from Shauna. Thank you, Shauna. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, our moderator, Candace Fortman. Candace is the executive director of Outlier Media in Detroit. And back in 2016, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation was one of Outlier's first funders. And since then, we've just been inspired and amazed by their growth and the fantastic work that they do. Shauna is coming to us and will show us how their work is, is rooted in community and equitable access to information which is what the children and families of Detroit really need. So Candace, I will turn it over to you to moderate this conversation, and I will join the panel as well. So thank you all for engaging with us in this very important conversation. Thank you. Thank you all so much for joining us this morning. I want to level set the room for a minute. I think that any room we enter into, we need to set an intention for that room, an intention for the conversation that we're going to have 
so that when we leave here, we understand what our marching orders are. We all have work to do in order to accomplish the many goals we're going to talk about on this stage today. So I'm going to lead the conversation with a quote that is the reason I do the work that I do today. It's a quote by the incredible novelist Alice Walker. Look closely at the present you are constructing. It should look like the future you are dreaming. And I think that speaks directly to what Lejeune just said. Each one of us has a role to play. I look out in this room and I see leaders from all across the state. We have the power to accomplish much more than we ever imagined. We have the power to build and imagine a radically new future for Michigan's families and particularly Michigan's children. And that is how we're going to level set this conversation today. And as you're thinking in your own lives about the work that you do, the power that you have, the possibilities that you can create, think about how you can walk out of this room and create change in your own community. So let's get started. I would like to hear a bit from um, Cheryl and Shana. Give me a one minute elevator pitch of the work that you do in your community. I'm gonna start with, start I'll start with Cheryl. Yes. Okay, all right. So I'll talk about the, uh, I'm with the Women's Commission and the Women's Commission is administering the My TriShare Child Care Pilot Program, TriShare for short. And this pilot shares the cost equally of child care between the employer, the employee, and the state of Michigan. Um, <clears throat> we launched the pilot in March of 21 with three pilot regions with bipartisan support from the legislature. In FY 2022, they, the legislature again uh, afforded us funds to expand the pilot. So we expanded to 10 more pilot regions in February of this year. So we have a total of 13 pilots. We're serving 59 counties <clears throat> in the city of Detroit. The Kellogg Foundation is funding two of those pilots, one in the city of Detroit and one in Battle Creek. And the Balmer Group is funding two pilots in Southeast Michigan one in the city of Detroit, and there's opportunity to uh, fund another pilot currently in Southeast Michigan. <clears throat> and the idea of the pilot is to retain and attract employees for the employers, so give them a benefit that they can offer their employees, for families to be able to afford child care, mm -hmm. affordable quality child care, and to provide some stability for child care providers in the regions that the pilots are running. Sure because we saw what happened to child care providers during the pandemic. Absolutely. And we know that they also need some support right now. That's correct. Program. All right, Shauna, same question. One minute elevator pitch, give it to me. Yeah, thank you. Um, first, I wanna say thank you for the incredible opportunity to um, share what we've been doing at Trinity Health. Um, this journey started uh, about eight years ago in Grand Rapids um, under amazing leadership there where we developed a process called the evidence-based selection process. Mm -hmm. And then standing on the success and the elements of the evidence-based selection process, we also um, created the evidence-based career navigation process. The evidence-based selection process helps us ensure that we are bringing the right people into the organization and putting them in the right seats. Our career navigation um, process helps us ensure that we're putting them into a series of jobs that are optimal for their career path. Both of these have been able to be scaled through the support and the commitment from the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. Um, the evidence-based selection process is now known as Higher Reach and is scaling across organizations um, in West Michigan and across Michigan. Um, and then our, our career-based um, navigation process is now Rise Up, which has been an amazing um, uh, a journey for us. We've actually had a $1 million impact in increased wages um, in just three years by helping individuals get onto career paths to higher paying jobs. Great. So we're gonna come back and we're gonna dive very deeply into both programs. But before we do that, Lejeune, I need to, to go back to the video. There was something that was said in that video that I really wanna sit with for a second. Um, so as we talk about the great reevaluation, which I think was really the right language to use there, um, because great resignation is one thing, but people are actually reevaluating their lives and thinking about how work should fit into their lives and can fit into their lives. So how do business leaders answer the call for this moment inside of the great reevaluation? Well, you know, 
there should be a reevaluation, first of all. And as employers, I, I think it's very important for us uh, to think about uh, the value proposition that we give to our employees uh, and the value proposition that we contribute to society. And for the Kellogg Foundation, I think hopefully it's, it's also a reevaluation for the employer because we had to change everything we thought about how work gets done. We had to reevaluate uh, where work gets done, when work gets done, how it's flexible uh, and accommodating to our employees, and um, how we were being equitable in that regard. And so I think that is the work before us today is to reevaluate this proposition of employer-employee, that relationship, and many relationships that happen in communities. Yeah. How, for those who have boards they need to make the case to, um, leadership that they need to make the case to, how do you make that case? How do you have that conversation about radical change? You know, not these small incremental changes, because that's not what folks are asking us for. They're asking us for big changes. Well, you know how they say, never let a crisis go to waste. Uh, <laughs> we, have, we have lived through this crisis, and uh, it was compelling in that moment. And for us, uh, you know, the doors closed, hmm. and we needed to continue to do work. And so technology and access uh, was critical for us. But then we had to think about all of our grantees and whether they had the same access we had to continue work. And so what we had to do at the Kellogg Foundation is think about how do we deploy resources into community. And the way we did that was uh, we issued a social bond of $300 million because we saw our grantees were not accessing any PPP loans. Right. So we said, if they can't access the money, we can. So let's access it and give it to them. So we accessed a social bond of $300 million, distributed all uh, over the past two years so that they could have access to technology and broadband and what they needed to keep their doors open. That's but, what I like to call a stillable idea. Exactly. That's and that's right. going to the board and saying, this is the right thing to do. That's right. And the board saying, absolutely, we're behind you 100%. Awesome. So you know, as a moderator, you're given a bunch of jobs, and I didn't do the one job I was told to do when I got here. Remind you that there are question cards on the table. So if you do have a question, <laughs> these blue cards are available for you to ask those questions. And someone will walk around the room and collect them uh, just before we get ready to wrap up. So. Blue cards. I did my job, Michael. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and so, um, you know, when we were doing a pre-conversation for this call, Shauna, you told me a story that has sat with me since that conversation. And I've thought about it quite often because we talk about how we bring tools in to help us to deal with bias, to deal with equitable hiring. But we know that tools are built by humans, and humans are flawed at best. And so can you share a bit of that story and talk a bit about how you have been able to not just bring tools into the workplace, but also really training that has helped with hiring, particularly people of color mm -hmm. that ha might have been left out of the hiring process? Yeah. Thank you. Um, first, I, d I just want to um, just give credit to the amazing leadership of Trinity Health. I mean, we. We've been on the, um, the diversity equitable journey for quite some time before it was even like the popular thing to do, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, eight years ago or so when we developed the evidence-based uh, selection process, our hiring leaders weren't really sure how it worked. Um, they were, like many organizations, used to hiring. We look at resumes. If it feels good in an interview, we'll hire them. If it doesn't, we won't. Um, the evidence-based selection process helps us put tools, assessments, um, data behind the individuals that we're hiring. Mm -hmm. We do this before we send them to the hiring managers. So we already know the candidates that we're sending to our hiring managers are a fit for our organization in some way. 
Um, at that time, I had just started working um, six months new with Trinity Health, so you know, still trying to stay in the honeymoon stage and, and trying to figure um, out how to get in your email. Try, <laughs> trying to figure out how to get in my email and, and make an impact. Um, and we had uh, someone that was just coming out of retail. She had finished. She wanted to be a nurse in the worst way. Um, had just finished her nursing assistant training program. Single mom, happened to be African American. Um, and we have a rating system with the candidates that we hired and she came out a, a four and a half star out of five candidates that she should be working for us. So we sent her um, to several interviews with several different nursing leaders and she wasn't getting hired. Hmm. And um, so when we would go back to the nursing leaders for feedback, they would say, well, she's worked in retail. We don't know if she can relate to the patients. Um, she's been in management. How is she going to take having to work under someone else? And I'm thinking, well, I don't, th I don't know anybody that doesn't have a boss, right, that we have mm -hmm. to report to. Mm -hmm. um, so I had the, the pleasure of picking up the phone and calling our chief nursing officer and asking for her help. Um, because we had evidence that this person, um, we had data that supported that this person belonged in our organization. And again, she had gone through several interviews and been declined. And so uh, our chief nursing officer said, you know what, send her back through an interview. Let me take a look at her. We hired her. Um, several years later, she is now um, an ICU nurse for us. Um, and she helped us get through this pandemic as an ICU nurse. And um, we wouldn't have had, our talent acquisition team or myself wouldn't have had the confidence um, to say this is the right person for our organization had we not had the evidence-based selection process now known as higher reach that's being scaled to other organizations. Sure. I'm going to tell you as someone who sold kids' shoes at JCPenney, nothing prepared me for the job I have more <laughs> <laughs> than that job. So. <laughs> <laughs> Never overlook the skills that retail can teach us all over right. the board. <laughs> um, Cheryl, I'm going to move to you. We have been in a moment. Mm -hmm. hmm. How has the workforce forever been changed? And how has it particularly impacted women and families in our state? Well, since February of 2020 to the December of 2021, nearly 300,000 women have left the workforce entirely in the state of Michigan. And nationally, uh, mothers with children 13 and younger are still not w employed where they were pre-pandemic. So there's, there's work to do there. And a lot of it correlates directly, you know, obviously to the childcare issue. And in late 2019 and early 2020, the Women's Commission traveled the state talking to women, asking what their priorities were. And Everywhere we went, didn't matter where we went, it was economic security issues. It was paid, paid leave, equ uh, pay equity, pathway to higher wage jobs. And at the top of the list everywhere we went was affordable, accessible childcare. And this was before the pandemic mm -hmm. hit. Mm -hmm. So there is absolutely nothing good about the pandemic. However, it did illuminate the issue of childcare. Mm -hmm. And now our community leaders and our business leaders and our policymakers are talking about childcare as an economic driver, not just as a family decision. That's right. So um, that's the good news about it. And <clears throat> um, it's helping families, the TriShare, you know, that's one of the reasons why TriShare is a solution, is a part of the solution for the childcare issue. And it is helping some families. Right now, for example, there's a couple in Traverse City who was, because they enrolled in TriShare, they were able to save uh, enough money for their first down payment on a home. Mm -hmm. Until then, they'd been living in, with their parents or in Ooh, military housing that's with rough. their child. Mm -hmm. And so it's working. It's helping families right now. Mm -hmm. um, about a month or so ago, I was reading um, the 19th, which is, a uh, national nonprofit newsroom focused on women's policy and, and, and issues. And in that reporting, I saw something that made me stop in my tracks. Um, they did a search, uh, uh, they did a study um, of how many women in each state were working at $15 or less, or making $15 or less in each state. And in Michigan, 60% of women of color make 
less than $15 an hour. Lejeu, <laughs> where do we go? How do, what do we need to do? What do the folks in this room need to do to make sure that we can address that urgent need? And I, I want to start with the, the issue of child care because that is a, a fundamental foundational issue for women as they are considering uh, the opportunities that they have. And just to give you a live example, we have work happening in the city of Detroit, Hope Starts Here, which is about uh, providing child care for every child in the city of Detroit uh, in the age range of zero to four. And before the pandemic, just as was stated, this was an issue. We were uh, short 28,000 seats in the city of Detroit. Since the pandemic, that number has actually grown. It grew up to 40, over 40,000. And now we are working it back down. Uh, and so that will require uh, many actions to be able to provide that. But the partnership between employers, people in community, and funders, et cetera, is critical as we weave the systems back together to take care of our children. And as women reevaluated during this time period, many of them left the workforce in numbers, as you've stated. And I think what we have to do is be very accommodating, again, for women as they're thinking about their careers. Uh, at the Kellogg Foundation, when you think about, you know, just access to breastfeeding, uh, a way to be able to be a mother and an employee at the same time. Those types of accommodations are critical for women if they're going to feel as if uh, they can balance the different requirements that they have uh, for having that stable family as well as providing and working uh, and having a career. And I think those are the types of uh, accommodations that employers have to think about in order for us to make sure that uh, we have an environment where, where women can thrive. Yeah and particularly women leadership. I, one thing that I'd like to, to point out is we're not just talking about getting women to $15 an hour. We're talking about getting women to the C-suite and letting them run organizations. Mm -hmm. I looked at an audience, and the first person I saw was one of my dear mentors, Shahida Mausi, is sitting here. And we've talked often about women of color and leading for-profit organizations in particular, and about the very low rate of women of color who are able to get the funding needed in order to build organizations like the one she and many other women in this um, state have been able to build. And so as I think about those numbers, Cheryl, I want to come back to you a bit. Mm -hmm. um, you are addressing a child care issue. Mm -hmm. But as you hear a statistic like that, 60% of women of color in Michigan making less than $15 an hour, what else do you think we need to do? Who isn't at the table? Who isn't a part of that conversation? Who do you need to come to the table so that we can address this large gap? Right. You know, we see it as we need a culture change. And we're looking at care work. And we need a culture change around caregiving work, where uh, most of the women, and especially women of color, those other jobs they have. Let's take the child care industry, for example. 85% of small businesses, child care providers, are women owned. 40% of those are owned by women of color. So um, it's important that we value this work. The average pay for a child care worker is $11 an hour, which is not a living wage. Um, so if we can't change the culture right now, we need to we have some good policy. Mm. And Governor Whitmer just unveiled, I think last week, the Caring for My Future uh, program, which is investing $100 million to help pay for pay providers more, child care providers more, prop up the existing child care providers, as well as have 1,000 new child care providers in the state by 2024. So 
this kind of policy until we have a culture change and we actually value our, uh, the care for our elders and our children and uh, this kind of policy can help. Sure. Um, Lejeune and Shauna, I want to ask you both this question. What is the role of racial healing work in the conversation that we're having today? Because it's impossible to have this conversation about equity without talking about the role of racism in this country, of misogyny, of course. But particularly, I want to stick here with racial heal healing. Yeah. So what is the role um, that that plays, and how do we begin to address it in our individual organizations? That's great. Um, and I'd like to answer by just sharing the story of the W.K. Kellogg Foundation in this regard. In, in 2007, our board, after uh, engaging in some critical racial work uh, training, proclaimed that the W.K. Kellogg Foundation would be an anti-racist organization. Uh, and again, 2007. Um, but this took then great commitment throughout the organization to make this happen. And so the entire organization took a journey together. And it was about understanding what being an anti-racist organization means. And for us, it started with racial healing. Because while we were working together, we didn't have those kind of relationships that were rooted in trust and uh, from knowing one another as human beings, as people who were very different one to another, but yet could come together around a common mission for an organization. So as an organization, we began uh, a journey of training. We have uh, an actual publication called One Journey where we documented this work over decades. Um, but if you think about that time period, we now are an organization where over 50% of our employees are people of color, and our board uh, is 60% people of color. That's a big change. That's right. mm -hmm. And you know that didn't just happen overnight, uh, and it wasn't about quotas. It was about training people to heal. And healing is about trust building. Healing is about relationship building. It's about bringing people together. And for us, what we believe is healing is at the heart of racial equity. You don't achieve racial equity if you're not first going through this process of racial healing. Right. So that everyone is creating that transformation together is not a mandate. Uh, it's not people who continue to believe that if you're a person of color, you're inferior, you automatically aren't qualified. But instead, it's about building relationships where people trust and honor one another and support one another. Because actually, if you have a colleague that need support, uh, you don't judge them, you help them. That's what an organization is all about. And that's what the healing journey is all about, is how do we lift one another up and be supportive? And so that's been, we call it our inside out game. So we don't fund anything about racial equity that we haven't also mm. engaged in and uh, committed ourselves to as an organization, which I think makes us better partners, uh, but it's a journey that I think any employer must take. That's right. Shauna, let's talk about implicit bias training and the work that Trinity Health has done around implicit bias training. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you for that response. It was so thoughtful, and it, it, I just want to back up for a moment and recognize that our own um, CEO and president, uh, Mike Sabowski of Trinity Health, has come out and said that racism is a public um, national health crisis. And he did that very quickly. And, um, and that type of leadership at the very top has cascaded down to the rest of the leadership. Um, so we have, again, been on this journey for a very long time, but as of recent, you know, the, the, the climate has gotten worse, right? Mm -hmm. um, but back to your question about implicit bias. So, 
When, when we started down this journey many, many years ago, um, we realized that it wasn't just enough to have a, a process that um, identified the very best people to come into the organization. And by the way, having that process increased our diverse workforce from 18% to 38% at one time. Um, but we also knew that we had to, to bring the leaders along. They had to understand and be educated on um, the process and, and what it means to have implicit bias, and it's normal in most hiring practices. So uh, Trinity Health in Grand Rapids at the time um, was one of the only organizations that took um, close to 600 of their leaders offline for an entire day um, and put them through an implicit bias training. Um, and it was very eye-opening, and, and when you talk about trust, there had to be a lot of trust in that room and just to have dialogue back and forth about what we experience as individuals. Um, and then building on that, Trinity as an organization um, has committed to our, our diversity, um, equity, and inclusion um, practices, our structure. We have leaders in every single one of our regions. We're doing um, monthly uh, Together Strong um, webcasts and, and um, training. We have mandatory training that's, um, that our new leaders have to go through. So at every turn, um, you know, it's, it's a journey. It isn't something that gets fixed overnight. It's a culture change. It's a mind shift. Um, and so we've been on that journey, and we continue, like everyone else, to keep trying to find the secret sauce yeah. um, to make things better. And I want to point out, she said building on. Because it's not a one-day training, it's a process, it's a continuous process. Because you change leadership and leader, and things change in the world, so it is a consistent and continuous process. I think this is the point, I was just about to say it, look at that. Thank you very much. Hmm. Okay. All right, so this is the point at which I have to remember how to read cursive, so here we go. <laughs> I'm telling on myself here. Okay, so this is a question for each of you, and, and, and Cheryl, I'll start with you, and we'll just go down a row here. So with so much focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion since George Floyd, how do each of you define equity, especially in the city of Detroit, where more than 77% of the residents are black? So oh, well, Cheryl, we'll start with you and, and go down. How do we define equity? Diversity, equity, and inclusion. Diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yeah. Um, opportunity for everybody. And equal, making the playing level equal and equity as far as providing the tools necessary, like childcare, to let everyone work if they want to work and have a career path, a higher path. Yeah. Shana? Yeah. So I look at it um, two ways, and, and I've, um, this is how I kind of measure the success of some of the programs that I've been able to, to influence and help lead. One is, how many diverse participants do we have? How many diverse individuals are we hiring? How many diverse participants do we have going through workforce development programs? And then what's the economic impact? What's the economic, economic added value? Um, once they're entrusted to us as our colleagues, what are we doing with them to ensure that they have economic opportunities within our organization? And then what is that value? Going back to the program um, that the W.K. Kellogg Foundation is funding for us, Rise Up, just in three years we've been able to have over a million dollar economic impact in increased wages mm -hmm. for individuals. And so for, for myself and, and for the programs that we're leading um, around workforce development, those are the two main areas that we look at is the participation of diverse individuals and then the economic value that we're adding to their lives. Sure. And I want to say I love that question uh, because it said, you know, in Detroit where there's almost 80% people of color, what does racial equity mean? And I think it's important to, first of all, the fundamental definition is that everyone should have an opportunity to thrive regardless of their skin color, of their zip code, of their um, you know, physical attributes, et cetera. So we believe that this is a very expansive de definition. 
and it means that all people uh, should not be predetermined based on physical traits. But when you look at a city of Detroit, you also have to think about structural racism and how structural racism works in that community. And when I say structural racism, is things like housing policy, is things like uh, mass incarceration and how does policing work in a community. Uh, and, and unfortunately, in the city of Detroit, uh, what you find is some of these structures and systems have disadvantaged some people and advantaged others. Mm -hmm. And so you may say, what's at work in the city of Detroit? It's definitely not uh, racism from one person to the other. It's systemic racism. It's how are people denied access to opportunities systemically. And that's why it's perpetual. Uh, the system is actually working mm -hmm. to produce the exact result that it was intended to produce. And that's what we're trying to break down and transform. It's looking at what policies are producing these results repeatedly, and how do we change those so that people do have real opportunities to thrive. So that's what we think about when we look at racial equity, particularly in a city like Detroit where the disparities track by uh, demographic and, and color very specifically is correlated, and we want to prevent that from happening in the future. That's right. I think if anybody reads the census data, which you should, um, you can see exactly what you're talking about. It is right in the data. The data is, is telling the story very directly. Shana, this question is actually, um, I, I believe, addressed directly to you. Can you describe the evidence-based hiring selection process in more detail? And what evidence was gathered? And then how did you collect the evidence? Mm -hmm. And I would be happy to talk to anyone offline um, as well and, and, and introduce them to the Higher Reach um, program so that they can learn more. But really, at the essence of it, we're using um, structured interview guides um, every time so that we are being consistent in our interviewing process. We're using assessments that are measuring an individual's competency to do the job um, and not look at them and say, oh, they've worked in retail, so they can't possibly take care of patients. Um, and then we're looking at um, the different uh, personality traits that also fit the different jobs and how they'll be successful in, in that role. Um, and then we have a system um, that actually will say, based on the, the data that we're putting in, this is a three-star candidate, this is a four-star candidate, five-star candidate, mm -hmm. whatever that might be. Um, and we can go back and look at where the candidates may be lagging at a little bit. And oftentimes, if we say, well, a candidate's come out and they're like, oh, this is a, a three-star candidate, we stop, we pause, and we say, that doesn't mean we're not going to hire them. We just need to understand why they're a three-star candidate and where they might fit differently in the organization. Um, and so it's actually helped us move individuals into other jobs that they wouldn't have considered mm. by saying, hey, you know, have you thought about this role or this type of role? So that's basically how we're using it. And then our hiring leaders can have the confidence um, that talent acquisition has done their job as talent partners um, and identifying and bringing forth the right candidates for them to interview for the, those particular roles. Sure. But I know that, um, that the, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation would be thrilled to um, talk to anyone that would be interested in the Higher Reach program. Great. It's definitely action, right? <laughs> Things are working. That's yeah. right. So a question again for each of you, and Cheryl, I'm going to start with you. Give me one lesson you learned as a leader during the pandemic. Um, I was amazed that uh, how well working remotely and how quickly we came around to working remotely and how things still got done and just the, and getting on top of the technology and making that happen. I think that's, that was something that really hit home for me. The, and it's great for women because we need those flex, that flexibility and it's this flexible schedules and the ability to work from home I think is, is a huge bonus for women. Yeah. Shana? Um, well, first I wanna, I wanna start off by saying that the pandemic really just um, 
expedited a shifting market, right? The market had already started to shift. We had already started to see um, uh, uh, workforce tightening. We, we've started to see that there's um, only one graduation for every two retirements. Um, so what the pandemic did is it forced us to get into action really quickly. <laughs> um, and so what it taught me was that um, innovation is critical. We have to think differently about a workforce. We have to think differently about how we're upskilling individuals in our communities. We have to think differently about how we are being more inclusive and in inviting people into or back into the workforce. Mm -hmm. We can't, um, gone are the good old days where we could just shift the resumes and decide who we wanted to bring into the organization. We actually have to reach out into communities that maybe we wouldn't have even thought of in the past and give them a noble purpose in our organizations. Mm -hmm. We've got to be inclusive. We've got to have reentry programs. We've got to have upskilling programs. And we have to be in an organization, we have to be positioned as organizations to be inclusive, to want people to come and work for us. Yeah. And then we have to be innovative in the approach and how they come and work for us. Great, great. And I would echo what's already been said, but just to add one more piece to this, I, it, it, it made me think about shared fate. Mm. And uh, this was a moment where we were all impacted yeah. by everyone else. And it made us think about how do you create uh, an environment where everyone is safe right. and where everyone prospers. Uh, and you couldn't leave anyone out. And, and, and there was that moment, and I think it's uh, a moment that we must continue to think about, particularly in this work and in this state. Uh, and we, you know, we've published this uh, a piece of research called The Business Case for Racial Equity, mm -hmm. and it's about shared fate. It says that if all of us in our state would make sure that every person had an opportunity to thrive and could be live within their uh, own capabilities, that we would actually create $92 billion of GDP for the state of Michigan by 2050 by including everyone and making sure that we're not leaving anyone behind. And I think this moment of this pandemic was a moment for us to really consider that. As we saw people leaving the workforce in droves, all of a sudden we understood that we were all interconnected, both in our health and our prosperity. And, and this is a moment for us to really think about how we continue to work for all, the good of all of us. Yeah. Because equity and justice is a bottom line issue. Exactly. Um, but it's also an issue of the heart. And I think I'll just answer the question before we wrap up into our last question by saying that the one thing I learned is that I could bring all of my experience to my work. And one of the things I really leaned into was the practice of care and thinking about how do we care for the folks that we hire, how do we care for the families that they're raising, that they are trying to keep safe, and that that is something that we have to continue to do even when we are not in a pandemic. Because most of us, many of us, especially particularly for our families in Detroit, are living in some form of crisis much of the time. And so it's not just about how we care for folks during a pandemic, but it's about how we care for folks all the time. So I'm gonna stop, thank you. <laughs> So as we wrap up our conversation today, Lejeune, I have one final question for you, and it's for this room. So this is the one part where if you have not been paying attention, you must pay attention now. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> so what is your call to action for the folks in this room? And then what can they do tomorrow as they walk into their work to take action to better support the workforce? And then of course, I will ask the most important question I'm sure many people in this room want to know, what are the resources that the W.K. Kellogg Foundation can assist them with in getting to that work? Great, okay, well. Um, <laughs> Ears on, this is it folks. <laughs> as I said as we began this conversation, we wanted this to be about action. This wasn't just a conversation, this was to 
to really think about what can we do, each and every one of us, as leaders. And um, so we think this is a moment now to act, right? We've all been through this experience that I think has allowed us all to grow and understand one another. And so as we think about this being our moment, uh, there are some things that we can do. First of all, we can work better together. And again, that's why I said I was so happy to follow uh, Van Jones as he talked about how we can work together. Uh, no matter who we are and what we believe, we can work together across the aisles and across the sectors. And what we really want to do is to begin that conversation uh, in this space of healing, in a space of love. How do we connect with one another and respect one another for what we bring to the table, respecting our individual truths um, and our love for our communities and our love for the people and children and families in the communities. So we can do that. We can begin to just connect and talk to one another. We also want to talk a little bit about this concept of healing. And some people you know, think it's soft. Uh, and as I said earlier, it's actually the hard work, mm -hmm. connecting with another person and, and thinking about um, how you understand and respect the differences that they bring together, but also then to think about how you work together within that. And then we also think there are some policy opportunities out there that we all should reflect upon. The one that you've heard about is early learning and education. And we believe that we can increase the number of children who are served by the Michigan's Great Start Readiness Program. And we want to be able to help prepare the state's youngest residents for academic success and economic outcomes. But we have to remove the barriers that our working families and children have. And at the core of that is access to the earliest form of development. So there are policies uh, that speak to the issue of early learning and education that we should pay very close attention to. We also want to respect what works already. And we know that the earned income tax credit works for people and children. So we know that that's proven, and we want us to continue to advocate on behalf of making sure that that exists for our, our families. And then finally, as ARPA dollars are being deployed, we must make sure that the funds are deployed in a way that create equitable opportunities for access and success. We've said that. You've heard the words, and you also know it's easier said than done. Uh, but just asking more questions about who will benefit if we do it this way. Uh, is there another way? Who should we talk to before we make this decision? Where can we find a greater uh, table where people can give us their insights? How do we speak to people in community? And most importantly, because we are all leaders in our own respect, how do we demand that we pause and really reflect on whether we are creating new opportunities and access for all people uh, and not just status quo, because this state deserves better than status quo. So we want to commit to making sure that we seize this moment for our children and families of Michigan. And as I said before, uh, it behooves all of us to do so, because it helps all of us. And finally, when we talk about racial equity, I want you to know that that is a very expansive definition. We're not just talking black people or white people. We are speaking about all people. 
and all children. And we want all children, regardless of who they love, regardless of their religion, their race, to be able to feel that this world is here for them and the opportunities exist for them. And so with that, I just want you to leave this room knowing that we all have a moment. And it's a moment where we can act to transform what we see as a future for children. And our moment is now. So thank you and please engage as the leader as you are uh, to make sure that tomorrow is different for children than yesterday. Thank you. Thank you all so much for joining us and reimagine a radically better future for your communities. Thank you all so much. <laughs>